Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. So, in our last episode, if you've watched it, and if you haven't, please go ahead and do so, I presented this EEPROM adapter slash dev cartridge that'll let you burn your own ROMs, either 2K or 4K, using the zero inf insertion force socket, put in the, uh, the EEPROM, latch it in place and then plug this into the game console and it would play this and we saw it work however this one needed an extra a 7404 inverter chip here because uh, the EEPROMs use an active low chip select whereas whereas the mask ROMs that are in cartridges use an active high chip select. And the reason for that is is they use address line 12 as a chip select. When address line 12 is high, the, EEP, the ROM should get activated. And when doing a mask ROM, it's very easy to specify along, of course, with the contents, the ma mask itself, whether the chip select should be uh, active high or active low. Well, they chose active high, of course, because address line 12 when it's high, should, uh, it should enable it, and that's the way it worked. However, for us, we need to invert that signal to make it work. Now, what today's subject is, is so, we looked, last time we looked at a game that's one of the holy grails of the collector, uh, Chase the Chuck Wagon. Not a fantastic game, nonetheless desirable, and... Uh, Whenever I want to play Chase the Chuck Wagon, I got to get this thing out, plug it in, have the ribbon cable here, put the right ROM in, and play it. So, what if we wanted to make a dedicated cartridge for Chase the Chuck Wagon, or even better, just a cartridge, just this part, that you could open up and replace an EEPROM with either a, another 2 or 4K EEPROM? and have that work for you. So that's what we're going to attempt to do today. Here we have the carcass of a 2K cartridge and aside from trying to figure out how to get this inverter mounted in here and still make this fit uh, into the shell properly, now there's, there's room in the shell but uh, we don't really want to have to deal I mean, there's room over here, but we don't. I'm trying to avoid having to flywire this whole thing as much as possible. But then when I looked at this, I also noticed that. Uh, see, there's a missing contact finger over there. It turns out that that contact is address line 11. And the reason it's missing is it's a 2K cartridge, and if you do your math correctly, you need A0 through A10 to properly address a 2K ROM. You don't need A11. So they just left it out. And the A11 pin is uh, tied high. So uh, we'd have to add this, which, which is doable. I mean, if you have some metallic tape like this and you, you can cut a finger To this size, super glue it over here and then solder a wire to it and get a connection. But you also have to cut a bunch of connections. Again, let me see if I can get that to show, but you'll see that this is the VCC pin and it's shorting to other pins over here because it is a uh, 2K cartridge. So, in, in short, yeah, it's, it's going to take a fair amount of work. I mean, it's going to take work to do this, but what can we do to reduce this work a little bit? So that's a lot of work to do. Let's try to reduce our work a little bit and take a cartridge that already contains a 4K ROM, which hopefully has not hopefully, but has to have the A11 finger present 
on the PCB? Why am I taking apart a highly collectible uh, cartridge? Because this is a duplicate. And this isn't lying. I did try it out. I used uh, isopropyl alcohol on the contact. I used acetone on the contact. Nothing helped. Uh, it, it, you just get a blank screen. So, since there's really nothing in here other than a ROM, there either is damage to the edge connector, but I can observe that from here. I can't really show you, but when you look inside, there's no apparent damage here, and we'd have to take it apart. Well, we are going to take it apart to see what it looks like inside and use this as our sacrificial lamb. And, uh, yeah, the only sad thing is we have to destroy the label, but I can't take these off in one piece, so it doesn't really matter. I'm going to clean off the label anyway. Oops, the camera wasn't on, but I've located the screw hole by just sticking the screwdriver. I mean, you run your finger over it till you feel the, the, uh, the round uh, hole for the screw, and then just stick a Phillips in there and get this thing out. And uh, now we have to retract the shutter. And pry this thing apart. And this one does not want to come apart. It's fighting me, but not for long. And no, it didn't break any tabs off. And here it is. This actually has a shield over the ROM. And let's verify that we do in fact have address A A11 on here. And there it is. Right here. So now I got to take off the shield and remove Remove the mask ROM from it. I won't bore you with that. We're just going to take soldering iron to it. Suck out the uh, solder and get that chip removed. Okay, the deed is done. We can see this side. Solder is removed. And it actually comes out. And here we have a pretty clean board. I'll probably go over it with the iron to make sure that all the solder is out of the holes. And then we confront the next problem, and that is this cartridge we want to put EEPROMs into it, so it should have a socket here. No big deal. I have several sockets, but if I put in a socket and then I put in an EEPROM here, it won't fit into the uh, cartridge shell. It's got the protrusion here that holds the shutter spring, and theoretically I could cut a rectangular hole in here which would also make it easier to replace ROMs because it would have a hole here to put ROMs in, but that would look crappy with a big hole in it, and I would not be able to install the shutter correctly. And I do want to make it look somewhat... I want to make the resulting cartridge look somewhat original in the end, so we have to come up with a different solution, which is either we solder in the EEPROM, and we dedicate this board to whatever EEPROM we solder in, or we go through my drawer of old stuff and find a bag that says, Peel Away Machine 
and I think pin is what, what it said. And what this is is kind of a cool invention. It's basically a very, very, very low profile socket. And it comes on a carrier strip like this. And each of these pins fits into a hole on the PCB on this end but it's actually a miniature pin and on this side it'll accept one of the IC pins and to demonstrate that I have one pin here that you can kind of see and that's why I have to clean out these holes really well but uh, we put the pin I just lost the pin that's why it's on a carrier strip. You're supposed to put all of them in at once, but... It's fighting me again. I think there's too much solder in. But the, the result of this is that... Basically, we will have a socket that is almost flush with the PCB, and then we can put EEPROMs into it, to our heart's content and pull them out. I mean, I don't know how long these pins will last. I suspect they wouldn't last very long. I'm still trying to put one in, but uh, being fat, it just doesn't go in because I think there's still a bit of solder left over in the holes. So let me clean out those holes and see if we can put two rows of 14 pins in there and see if now we have a flush socket. So it's done, but it took a little longer than I thought because the idea of inserting these pins with the carrier present and then melting the carrier off or ripping it off doesn't work. Uh, I don't know, maybe if you wave solder it, it magically disappears, but it didn't. So I basically had to pull all of the pins out one by one, insert them in the holes, and solder them in. Now, you see this with an almost perfectly flush uh, chip inserted. And is it actually a socket? I already buzzed it out. We have all the pins connected correctly. And it is acting just like a socket. Boom. We can uh, interchange the chip in there. This is what the, the pins look like. This is the other side. And it would have gone a lot faster if I hadn't soldered in the first five pins upside down and then I had to remove them and put them in the right way, but it looks like everything's in place now. So what we got to address to next is uh, we need to invert address 12 and route that to the chip select on here. Alright, the next issue we have is making a smaller inverter because uh, Putting a putting a dip a 7404 uh, an entire chip on there is going to probably cause problems inside the shell, and we only need a single bit inverter. So let's do some EE 101 here, and I'll show you what that looks like. We're going to use an NPN transformer transistor and we'll draw that right in the middle here and this is a 2N 3904 one of the most common transistors so the way this works is we have an input, let's call it A. And that is our, on the original cartridge, 
that is address line 12, and when that goes high, the select on the uh, on the mask ROM goes high and it selects the chip, but we're using a 2732 which needs a low on the select line. So uh, we come in here, we need a resistor to limit the current into the base and 1K is a good value for that. Then we need to supply power to it and let's call this 5 volts and a good value here is 4.7K. And I drew this badly but uh, the emitter goes to ground. And that's our complete circuit and the way it works. Oh, and uh, this is our output and we'll call it not A. So the way this works is if A is sitting at zero the transistor base is biased off which means viewing this whole thing as a switch there's no path from here to here and and all we're getting is uh, 5 volts. We do need this resistor, but because we're dealing with relatively little, sur uh, little uh, current here, this is fine to, to simply invert a digital signal. So again, if A is 0, the output here will be 1 because this is uh, this switch is deactivated and we're simply our path goes from 5 volts straight to, straight to the output conversely if a is 1 it biases the transistor on which now shorts this entire line to ground if it's 1 since we're connected to ground we get an output of 0 and there is your 1 bit inverter built from discrete. This was the easy part. Now of course we got to build it and make it fit onto the PCB. Here's our PCB with the peel away sockets. Give it a real nice low profile. And now, ta-da! I was hoping this wouldn't be this messy but uh, it turns out that I had to go in, cut a few traces, and bypass them. The mistake I initially made was I thought that the mask ROM that was in here, this guy, basically had a very similar pinout to a 2732 EEPROM with the uh, select lines inverted. But it turns out I was wrong. This chip actually is more like a 2532 EEPROM, which has a couple of pins moved. The 2532 was TI's version of the 4K EEPROM, and it didn't last very long. But for some reason, you find they were in pretty widespread use before they died after a few years, because the 2732 became the standard. But you can really, what you can see here, here's of course the transistor, your two resistors over here, and uh, everything connected in as neat a, as possible, which still didn't result in a lot of neatness. But here it is, it's all connected. I have a little bit of hot glue on the uh, transistor body and on the wires coming out here. There's heat shrink tubing on a lot of these connections. I've observed and looked at this and uh, unless this transistor comes loose, which it really shouldn't because the hot glue is going to keep it in place, it's not going to short to anything. And uh, so there's our cartridge. And we're not going to put it back in the shell yet, but we are going to we're going to insert it like this because I don't want to put the shell together and just to find out that I messed up and it doesn't work. But 
Ladies and gentlemen, confidence is high. I mean, look at this beautiful circuit over here. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen, place your bets. We need to insert this. The EEPROM faces away from the front. That would be kind of a bummer if you plugged it in the wrong way because the uh, EEPROMs don't like to have power and ground inverted at all. But, ladies and gentlemen, place your bets. Let's have a look at the monitor. And I am sliding the on switch up. And there it is. It worked. And we can play, we can now make our own chase the chuck wagon cartridge and impress all of our friends. Oh, we need sound. Oh, this is excellent. Oh, ah, he messed up. And for the hard part. Jostling the uh, console and the uh, and the cart PCB to see if there's any if I can make it mess up. Nope, seems to be it seems to be pretty stable. And. I guess for the final test of this, we should pull out the EEPROM with the uh, chuck wagon on it and put another EEPROM in to make sure that the uh, little socket pins all can withstand at least one or two uh, removals of the EEPROM and insertion of a new one. All right, looks like it survived removal and insertion of a new one. And uh, I didn't rip out any of the uh, connections on the back, so I think that's secure. So let's plug that in. And here goes power. Well, it shouldn't be a big surprise. I mean, it's also a 2732, so it should work. <laughs> See if there's any weird behavior. But yeah, it works. I'll probably test a few other EEPROMs. But I think the last thing we need to do is put that thing in a shell. And of course we have to swap in uh, the uh, Chase the Chuck Wagon because that was the original plan to have our own Chase the Chuck Wagon cartridge. And here's the cartridge, all dressed up with the shutter in place and everything. And our final test says, don't put it in backwards. And it's working. We are done. We set out to make our own cartridge with a uh, custom game. Well, not a custom game, but with basically any game that we have an image for, as long as it's 2K or 4K for now. But success. 
Well, it always feels good to achieve a goal you set for yourself when starting a video. And uh, we did. The last issue is that it was suggested to me that I may have been too harsh on judging the uh, 2600 Pac-Man implementation. Uh, I still stand by my word. I think it's it's pretty badly done. And the counter argument may be, well, if it's badly done, you know, maybe they couldn't do any better on the 2600. But what I'm going to do is uh, briefly play through three different Pac-Man games. And it's going to be the original Pac-Man that you've seen on the last one. What to refresh your memory, we will play it again. Not too long. The second game is Ms. Pac-Man. And the third game is Junior Pac-Man. And you be the judge of how the original compares to the other two. Now, I'm not trying to make a comparison of the original games. That's, that's a different matter. I simply would like you to judge the quality of the 2600 implementation of the three different games. So, we start with the original Pac-Man. Also keep in mind the sounds. Okay. This game also illustrates how important it is to have half decent sounds. But anyway, that was the original Pac Man. Next, we'll play Ms. Pac Man. At least they tried to emulate the real music. I mean, the uh, playfield geometry is not much different. The pills are still these elongated uh, pixels. But I think it sounds a lot better. And Ms. Pac-Man can be clearly identified. She's wearing a bow. In all fairness, I think they allocated more memory space to this game, but yeah, they definitely did because it actually has this demo sequence, not a demo sequence, but the startup sequence, and they at least tried to make an effort at making it look a little bit more like the arcade, so this definitely looks better than the original. And last but not least, Junior Pac-Man.
Yeah, you've got those ugly scan lines, uh, those black bars on the left uh, margin. That's a limitation of the 2600, because I think they ran out of CPU time there. And when the CPU isn't drawing the screen, it turns black. So. They even animated the propeller on Pac-Man's cap. Sounds are even an improvement over Ms. Pack. It is more responsive. And it's making the proper dying sound. Well, almost. But it's recognizable. Get the pretzel. There you go. So, uh, I think there's a constant improvement from one Pac-Man game to the other. Miss Pac and Junior Pac-Man are actually pretty good games for the 2600 especially but I still maintain that the original leaves a lot to be desired sure you know they sold 7 million of them but they made 15 million or 14 million of them so yes the audience obviously uh, did not meet what the marketing people expected so let me know what you think if you agree with me or disagree with me, but I think I made my point on the quality of the Pac-Man games on the uh, 2600. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, share, and let me know what you think. See you later.